It was the tradition of the first Christians to greet each other with the acclamation, Christ is risen, and in response, the other one would say, Christ is risen indeed. And so we will say and declare throughout the Easter season, Christ is risen. Christ is risen Blessed Easter to all, this Sunday culmination of what has been a hard 40 days, full of questions here at the Riverside Church, internal questions guiding our practice of discipleship during the season of Lent. Every week, the text would ask us another hard question. Can I resist temptation? Can I give up my life? Can I admit I'm wrong? Can I forgive? Can I be open? Can I step up? Today is Easter Sunday and Lent is over. So you'd think we'd be here today with an answer instead of a question. But I'm afraid to say that the text will not let us rest. Today our question is, can I welcome new life? The profound gift and mystery of Easter is that God meets us in the deepest, darkest, death-ridden realities of human living and always, always offers us the possibility of new life. The question confronting us today is whether or not we will welcome the possibility of resurrection and step into all that it offers us and offers our world. Can I welcome new life? In the small community of Swift Creek, South Carolina, it's an annual tradition for the entire town to show up at the cemetery very early on Easter morning for an Easter sunrise service. While the rest of the year, the Presbyterians and the Baptists and the Episcopalians worship in their own church buildings across town from each other, every Easter Sunday morning before dawn, everybody gathers in the pitch dark to worship together as the sun gradually rises over the surrounding hills. One year, just like every other year, all the Christians in town, which as you might imagine was pretty much everybody in Swift Creek, South Carolina, crowded into the small town cemetery, standing around awkwardly waiting for that beautiful moment when they would all sing together Christ the Lord is risen today. Well, the sun rose with stunning visual reminder of resurrection. As they stood there in the dark, the typical service unfolded. The music minister from the Lutheran church led the first hymn. The Baptist preacher prayed, which is sort of like a sermon, as you know. The service went on as planned until it was time for the real sermon which was the responsibility of the Methodists that particular year. But it was still dark, so the Methodist minister went to his car and looked in the glove compartment until he found a flashlight, then awkwardly tried to hold it while juggling his sermon notes. After the sermon was finished, someone else prayed, they sang a final hymn, and another one of the town's preachers gave the benediction to bring the service to a close. Awkwardly, when the last amen was said, it was still dark. The sun had not even begun to come up. It turns out that Easter was very early in March that year before daylight savings time. The sun wouldn't even begun to come up for another hour, but nobody thought to check. The people of Swift Creek, South Carolina, came out to celebrate resurrection in the dark. And when it was over, they trudged back to their homes in the dark. If I ever consent to leading an Easter morning sunrise service, which is highly unlikely, I will be sure to double check what time the sun is supposed to rise. But I thought the story of the Swift Creek Ecumenical Easter morning service was fitting for us today because for all the beautiful flowers and new Easter clothes and bunnies and triumphant music, 
The truth is that like the experience of the women at the tomb early that morning, you and I know that life begins always in the dark with death. Can I welcome new life? It's the text from Luke that raises the question for us this morning. You'll recall the two men in dazzling clothes, Luke says, pose the question to the women who were bowed to the ground, shaking in fear, wondering if they would be next. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? In other words, can you summon from deep inside your weary and grief-worn bodies and hearts the faintest possibility of new life? Notice that our gospel story of resurrection begins at the first verse of Luke's gospel, chapter 24, with one little word that changes everything. After, after a horrifying three days, Jesus, whom they'd loved, interrogated, tortured, killed, after the women cried at the foot of the cross and cared for his dead and broken body, then sealed the tomb to go home for the Sabbath, after they fell into an exhausted sleep and then woke on the dark edge of dawn, only for the memories to come rushing back in as reality set in. After all of that, they made it back to finish Jesus's burial at the tomb. And Luke begins chapter 24 with this word, but, but, when they got there, the women didn't find a body and they remembered Jesus' strange words about resurrection. But when they heard the witness of the shining men at the tomb, they realized they were locked in the darkness of death, unable to welcome the possibility of new life. But when they ran to tell the men about resurrection, that it was unfolding in front of their eyes, and the men dismissed their reports as an idle tale, they decided that death would not be the end of the radical gospel message Jesus came to teach. They decided they would welcome new life. Martyred Archbishop Oscar Romero from El Salvador said, there are many things that can only be seen through eyes that have cried. And that's how resurrection, new life, came into the world that morning. Unlike the other stories of resurrection in the gospel accounts, Luke's story doesn't say that anyone instantly believes. There's no Jesus appearing just in the nick of time to help them overcome their doubt. There's no moment of clarity in which everybody's preconceived ideas are immediately overturned. No resurrection happens gradually as the story is told over and over. First, the women stumbling to the tomb in the dark looking for Jesus who was not there. Then the women going to the disciples telling their unbelievable story to the doubting group. Then Peter, struck by the women's stories, heading to the tomb himself. It all started right there, resurrection. And shortly after Easter day, the disciples all started going around telling this incredible story of Jesus' death and the miracle of resurrection. They told the story over and over again in the weeks that followed, and little groups of people began to form, telling each other the story of resurrection one more time, bearing witness to God's presence and the hope of life emerging from death. Together, they decided they were going to face down the darkness, to stand up to death, to welcome new life, and slowly, Slowly, slowly as it did that first Easter morning, resurrection became a reality for people who needed to know the truth of God's work in this world, that death is real. 
and death is not the end. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Can you welcome new life? Can I welcome new life? Here we sit, 2,000 years after that dark Easter morning when the story unfolded and the first ones who experienced resurrection had the courage to bear witness to it. If we listen again to their witness, you and I will begin to remember if we try. Themes of resurrection running through all of our lives, all the time. God is well at work in this world and in us. Every single one of us has a resurrection story to tell. What's yours? Can you welcome new life? One of my favorite resurrection stories in modern literature unfolds in Alice Walker's Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Color Purple. The story of sisters Celie and Nettie is told in the form of diary entries and letters. And the story begins with Celie, a poor young black woman in 1930s Georgia who has been the victim of abuse her whole life long. Celie is forced into an abusive marriage against her will. And Celie and her sister Nettie go to live with her new husband. Things get really, really bad. And Celie pleads with her sister Nettie, the dearest person in her pain-filled life, to leave, to go, make a new life for herself. And Nettie leaves in a heart-wrenching goodbye, all the while promising, I will write to you, Celie. Time passes. No letters arrive. In her hopelessness and despair, Celie begins to believe that Nettie has died. After all, what other kind of scenario would make any sense? There was no word from her at all, no evidence that she was still alive. It's likely that the pain and horror of the lives they lived had just gone and swallowed her right up. Then one day, Celie finds a packet of letters that Nettie has written over all these years, letters hidden by Celie's husband who prefer that Celie live in hopelessness and desperation. Pulling the precious letters from their envelopes one by one, Celie could hardly believe that Nettie had been alive all that time. Her words of love poured from the pages like a soothing balm on a broken life. Just the thought, just the possibility that it might be true changed everything for Celie. She read the final letter in the stack. Dear Celie, Nettie wrote, I know that you think I'm dead, but I am not. I've been writing to you over the years, but your husband said you'd never hear from me again, and since I never heard from you all this time, I guess he was right. There is so much to tell you that I don't know hardly where to begin. But if this do get through, one thing I want you to know, I love you and I am not dead. Today, you and I are confronted with the question of whether we have the courage to take our own tentative experiences of resurrection, the ways in which we know that God is real and at work in this world and in our lives, and take the radical risk of welcoming new life. All the voices around them told the women at the tomb that morning that what they believed was just an idle tale. And all the pain of our lives and the desperation of this world might also lead you and me to believe that resurrection is nothing more than wishful thinking, the stuff of religious zealots and optimistic dreamers, an idle, 
useless tale. Because sometimes Easter morning comes and goes in the dark. And confronted with death and despair on all sides, we feel unable to welcome the Easter miracle of resurrection. But, 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 as we gather this morning to remind each other that Christ is risen, Christ is risen indeed, we know that deep down the resurrection we need, the resurrection our world so desperately needs is certainly, definitely, surely, so much more than just an idle tale. In fact, it's God. Can you look through the pain of your life and the desolation of this world and summon the courage to welcome new life? God is reaching across the human experience through a story of torture and death and hopelessness over 2,000 years of you and me and so many others stumbling from the darkness and the graves of our lives, terrified, then tentatively gathering the courage to welcome new life. Can you welcome new life? Luke's story of the women at the tomb is a reminder on this day of resurrection. I love you, God wants us to know, and I am not dead. Amen.